Good afternoon, everyone. Behind every man is a woman and is a cliche, but behind every soldier, there's a wife who stands behind him, supports him, and leaves him free to serve the nation. She wears no uniform, has no ranks on her shoulder, but is a patriotic and stands solidly in the silent ranks of military wives. As we are in the Women's Week, today we have as a guest in ADU's chat room an army wife who has seen it all, rearing up children single-handedly, postings every alternate year, non-family stations in both Jammu and Kashmir and Northeast, separation when husband is on courses, and above all, seeing him move with his regiment to the Kargil operations. You will find the face familiar, but this time on the other side of the ADS fence. She is Sangeeta Saxena, our editor, who will answer all the questions I put to her as today we discuss her most important role, that of an army wife. Welcome, ma'am. Welcome to ADU's chat room. And today you are on the other side of the camera. Thank you so much, Etali. Uh, it is a real surprise for me and also, you know, something which I'm not used to. I'm just not used to it. And uh, I'm sure I'm going to love it because the role of an army wife for me was one of the most important in my life. And uh, I'll be very happy to answer all your questions. Ma'am, I know you personally from the time as a journalist, as a, as a, a person who is uh, very good in the education field, and of course, a beautiful human being. But there's one section which not only me, but most of our friends, most in the friend circle, don't know about you. And that is you being an army wife for a very considerable long time. So how is an army wife different any, from your perspective? Uh, she is different. She's not different as a wife. I'm sure she's doing whatever all wives are doing. But the truth is that she's different. Before the how comes, what is different in her? Now, the difference in her is only one. That she is married not only to the man, but she's also married to the army. Her priority is not just the man, not just the husband, not just the in-laws, not just the family, not just the children, but absolutely army as her husband has shown it to her. And that is what makes her difference because she has a lot of things to see which normal routine wives would not do. You could be in an industry, you would not have seen your husband's office. You could have been in an industry, you could not have met your husband's colleagues' wives. You won't hardly, you would only know by name the boss. Many a times you don't, do, you don't know him by face. But in the army from the day one, when an army wife comes in, she's indoctrined into the army. She's welcomed into the army and she's not welcomed as, you know, Mrs. Saxena. I was not welcomed as Mrs. Saxena. I was welcomed as a youngster's wife who had got married to a captain in the army. And then, you know, that's where the senior ladies start telling you what is different in us. So we have to not just look after our husbands. We have to look after, a, you know, a lot of people who are there who we never know that you need to look after them, but you realize eventually that there are people you need to look after. They are the other ladies of the units where you're posted. And then, you know, you also have to ensure that uh, you have to play the role of the wife to the hilt, keeping in mind that your husband has a role in the army. So there is going to be a role for you. You cannot uh, be away from that role. So that is what makes us different. And now I'll come to your question, how we are different. We are different, you know, why? Because we have, you know, we have understood that, yes, we are married into the army. So we know that uh, priority is, yes, the husband uh, has to be sent off to the office, which is his unit. You are mentally prepared that, you know, he'll come back very rarely for lunch. He'll definitely come back to change into his sports uniform for the evening. Then he goes back. He plays and comes back. 
and then he has a lot of dark which comes in so then you get introduced to new terminologies and then you also start you know how we are different is that we've also got used to it so you know that the dr will come the dispatch rider will come with a lot of files and your husband will sit and see those files and the dispatch rider will come again and take them away and then you know that she's working and suddenly there'll be a call in the evening you never know i never realized that every evening somebody would call up to uh, you know give a feedback or i or my husband would call up to give a feedback to his senior that all is well and in a peace station so i was uh, you know very surprised and then suddenly i realized that yeah you have why it's different it's different i i got adjusted to it i had uh, you know you get adjusted to the fact it's it's ingrained into your psychology so then we are the we feel we are the stronger we feel that we are able to bear the separations we feel that we are able to send our husband very happily to wherever and whatever assignment without a tear in the eye and you are also different because you're strong you need to look after not only your family there is a family of 1200 women and fam- and their children who look up to you and you have your duties assigned so when your husband is junior you have uh, you know a platoon level to look after then he becomes a little senior you got the company level to look after then they become more senior and uh, you have a regimental level to look after which will have more than 1200 plus ladies so you're different you're strong you know that you have to be a part of it probably it's somewhere down uh, you know it's so much it's down in our psychology from the day one and that is how we are different we have learned to live the lives of reflected glory of our husbands which 99% wives do not so that makes us a great minority but a very welcome minority so we have a huge family we don't have a family of just two or four people that's great ma'am actually today you are representing the army wives you are representing that whole lot of brave women brave who are not fighting on the field but who are staying at their home holding their hearts that yes everything here is absolutely okay you go and fight for the nation so from you we would like to know how does an army wife stay when her husband is at field stations you have experienced this a lot so please tell us about it yes uh, chitali both both the field stations uh, of uh, J- uh, the jammu and kashmir as well as northeast now uh, you know it come in your at a peace station it comes as a little surprise uh, uh, that you know oh there's going to be a time when he has to go to the field what if he hasn't got to go alone the regiment will move to the field station the regiment could be at a peace station and it'll move to the field station so you get used to it you know what happens you'll very happily look forward to it because you know there's going to be exciting times now if you are a newly married wife you have the nearest family station where you can take your accommodation the government permits you that which is a lovely facility so you can be in jammu kashmir and uh, you can take your family station in chandigarh or uh, srinagar and uh, or jammu and it's very nice you know so that you are at a distance where you can your know, husband can come in once in 10 days 15 days and you know you can meet him but uh, you know it's you are you are alone but you're not lonely so what happens the moment the regiment goes away there's a little uh, dead which is left behind to look after the ladies and uh, you know you have people who come and ask you and in the cantonment when you're staying with uh, people from the you know officers from the other regiments also you still have uh, you know people coming to ask you oh so and so's husband's peer in this field station so they'll come and ask you there's if there's any problem let me tell you chatali we have never never felt a hitch about going to our neighbors and asking them and telling them our problem and never it could be 12 o'clock in the night and they would come over and they would take us wherever if you need to go to the hospital with a child you need to get anything there's an emergency there's a phone call from parents somebody unwell anything so field stations are separation for you from the husband yes and of course when your husband is at a location which is sensitive you also have this in mind you know the safety of the husband is a point in mind so that of course remains in your mind but then you know it doesn't make it the diff- army doesn't make it difficult for you to stay alone 
And if you have children who are studying in schools and colleges, then of course you decide to stay at the previous P station where you're allowed to keep your accommodation to the next uh, academic year. So you can always keep it. And then you can take a separated family accommodation if you need to continue. If you want to go to another station, which is nearer your husband's location, you can also do that. So it doesn't make it difficult. We have all the containment facilities. We've got the you know hospital facilities. So, uh, you know, all these facilities which are given to us by the army, uh, you know, at uh, they're actually called facilities, but they are, they are necessities and you have them. So it really makes life easier for us. And of course, the camaraderie of being an army wife. So that, of course, is there. The other ladies will never make you feel alone. They'll ensure that, you know, they are there to help you out. The men will always come. The officers will always come to ask you. You also have in the regiment, you know, everybody. So you never feel the, you know, you don't feel that your husband's not there. So things are, you know, a little less than what they were when he was there. His presence is not there. Yes. So I think that is the way we, we learn to, that's why we are different. That's how we are different. We learn to accept it as a part of our lives. We know the day you get married to an army officer, you know that this is a stage which is going to come. So we are mentally prepared. We know it's going to happen. It'll happen for two, three years. Then he'll come back. Then you'll go back to a peace station. And then again, there'll be a time when you he, he needs to go back. So again, you'll come to the same situation. And uh, I have always had very, very good uh, separated times. I've never had a problem. Yes, you miss the husband. That is definitely there. I mean, that is something you can't help. But then he's in the army. He has to do it. That's a part of his duty and call of duty is supreme for anybody in this country, more so for the defense forces. This is so this is so positive thinking, actually. I mean, I must say, obviously, I know you from such a long time and you've been always we have been always be saying the good things about whatever, whatever situation it is. So this is one of those examples where you see everything good and everything the best in any situation. <laughs> now, um, I have known you from 18 years. And during all these 18 years, I've heard a lot of times about Cargill, sir going to Cargill, when you also uh, went uh, to see him, uh, say him goodbye, and lots of other stories where you were reporting for the Times of India. I mean, there were so many other stories. But today, I would like to know your experience of bidding goodbye to your husband and his regiment when he was taking his unit uh, to Operation Vijay, Kar uh, Vijay in Cargill. And we would like to know from you every detail about that. I tell you, uh, you know, uh, ladies get married to army officers and their husbands retire. <laughs> and they've never seen many, many, many of them. Let me tell you, I've never seen such a thing. So I consider myself an absolutely blessed person. One of those real, uh, you know, lucky ones to have seen this happen. So my husband uh, was commanding his battalion uh, in the Northeast and uh, suddenly Operation Vijay happened. Now, I'll also tell you a little background about how we came to know Chitavi because uh, that was one of the most interesting things. In army, you know, whenever uh, a senior officer from a senior formation comes for a visit, so the wives get busy. So there was, uh, I, I was the CEO's wife and uh, there was an officer from the command and uh, we were busy and then we had to see them off to the airport. So when we went to see them off at the airport and uh, my, uh, the husbands, we were all sitting in the lounge and suddenly our husbands came and picked up their pee caps, you know, they have their pee caps, which they wear. So they picked up their pee caps and uh, they said, we're just coming back in two minutes. So we, you know, the ladies as inquisitivenesses are, you know, absolutely being. So all three of us rushed, you know, to the glass wall, which was there. And uh, we saw some activity behind the glass wall. So we just peeped in and we saw that there was a big box and, uh, you know, very sermon sort of a atmosphere. And our husbands reached and they stood there and they saluted. And then we realized, no, it was not a box. It was a coffin. And uh, when they came back, they told us that the body has come from Kargil. There is something going on there. And it is a casualty, fatal casualty. So the family which had come, you know, they, the, these people were going to take the body to the village which was there. And uh, the fam some members of the family had also come to the airport. 
And uh, after we uh, had seen off our guests, we were coming back. So in the middle, uh, you know, with, as the moment we entered the containment, you know, my husband saw another vehicle and then he said, you know, that uh, you, do, you do one thing, uh, you go home in this vehicle and going uh, in that. And I saw that the other vehicle, the person are standing outside the other, other vehicle was his adjutant. And um, I, I thought something would have happened. I, I, I didn't, uh, you know, question. You know, it's in the army, you don't question. So you don't question the husband at all, you know, because when it comes to official and duty matters, you don't question. So I said, okay, fine. I just went home. So the moment I reached home, uh, you know, the, I was told that uh, there will, there, this vehicle will stand. And ma'am, you have to go to the welfare. Now, let me tell you something about the welfare and ladies club, two very important things in the army. Ladies club is uh, the ladies club for the officer's wives. And welfare is where we want to do welfare for the men's wives and children. So it's the Jawans of the army who've got, most of them have wives. You know, now you've come to a stage where you get educated, you know, female education is very important. And, you know, even villages are getting educated women. But uh, when we were, you know, I'm talking of uh, 38 years back, uh, you had 90% women coming from the villages, getting married to 40 Jawans. And uh, most of them did not, you know, have uh, anything like a career, anything like, you know, uh, further education. So it was the duty of the officers' wives who were educated to educate their sisters who were the Jawans' wives to, you know, get them, uh, get people to inculcate skill development into him, uh, into them, you know, because now skill development is something which is being talked about now. But in those days in the army, we always had it. So, you know, those days you have to, uh, I still remember when I got married, there was this Usha sewing machine courses for, uh, you know, um, wives who wanted to learn, you know, uh, stitching and tailoring and eventually make that their career. Or, you know, uh, there were courses for making pickles and jams and poppers and things like that. So you had a lot of things. Some wanted to get educated. They had the basic education. So we could also get them to uh, go to open schools and do their class 10s and 12s or whatever for their education. Some wanted to do graduation. So, you know, you had those sort of things. So welfare was very important for us. So I was told when I reached home, I was told that I have to go for a welfare. And uh, I said, okay, fine. But I was very surprised because the welfare had already happened that once a month you have this welfare meet. So I, I said, okay, fine. So I just went off to the welfare center. And the moment I reached the welfare center, I found the adjutant and two, three other officers there. And I saw the officers' ladies there. And the moment I entered the hall, it was jam-packed. It was jam-packed with uh, 800 plus ladies. And I was zapped. I was totally zapped because I couldn't understand as to why. And then, you know, uh, I was uh, very nicely uh, took, taken aside by the advocate and told that ma'am, orders have come to move. And we've called all the ladies. Now you have to make this announcement to them. So, uh, I mean, it was something new for me. It was something which I had never thought I would ever have to announce. And, uh, you know, to tell ladies, uh, 800, 100 plus of them, that your husbands are going to war, huh? And uh, but I, but I was always one of those, you know, who always uh, felt that yes, you could take a, tackle a situation as it comes. So my uh, sales of my, uh, you know, uh, ship always went into the right direction. So I told them, I said, don't worry. Do they know? So he said, could be that their husbands have told them. And my husband had not told me anything. So as a rule, he never told me anything till it was actually decided it had to happen. So and then uh, I stood, you know, I went to the mic and uh, I like talking. So I started telling them, you know, that uh, see when we are, uh, when we get married to, uh, you know, forgies, uh, we, we know that there's going to be a day of pride in their lives when... Uh, you know, they're going to uh, war, where they're going to fight the enemy. That's an ultimate for a soldier. And uh, we as wives should take pride in this and that. And uh, suddenly one of the ladies got up and said, uh, oh, we know, ma'am, you know, uh, we know they are going to Kargil. So I, I, I did make things very easy for me. I said, good. I said, you know, they're going to move in three days so uh, or two days. So they said, yes, we know. 
So I said, now how, how can we support them? So uh, they said, no, we are very happy. We have no problem. One or two of them had tears. I won't say they had tears in their eyes. And some of them, you know, uh, they said, how are we going to stay? So I said, don't worry. You just relax. Listen to what I have to say. I said, we have just two days. First of all, all the uniforms, etc., whatever is required, because civilian clothes we knew would not be required there. So I told these ladies, I said, ensure that all the uniforms and everything are done up and your husbands don't require. We don't know how long they're going to be there. So they don't require anything. So they said, yes, man, that of course is there. I said, then we don't know for how long. So whatever you have in your kitchens, what can we give to them? Suppose they don't get fresh vegetables. They want to have parathas. What will they have roti and parathas there? So can we give them a char? Can we give them, uh, you know, jams? Can we give them whatever? So you'll be surprised, you know, every home in this country and more so because the troops of Punjab and uh, Maharashtra and, uh, you know, and the rest of them from the rest of the country. So everybody said, we've got a lot of achars in our home. We can make them for ourselves later on. We'll give them to these guys. <clears throat> Any amount of, uh, you know, whatever I told them, I said, look, we are going to ensure, so whatever you want to make. So some of them came up with brilliant ideas. They said, let's make, you know, some dry snacks and give it to them. So uh, some said that let's make, you know, let's make for some days, let's give them, you know, things which they can eat. So we decided, okay, how, what would be comfortable? So then I told the, you know, the regiment uh, is divided into companies. So I told the company commander's wives were there with me. So I told these company commander's wives that, uh, you know, now we will all talk individually. You talk individually to your companies and I'm giving you one hour and you decide as to who wants to do what. And I will take a call as to how the, whatever is available in the regiment, in the mess, in whatever, we will help out to make things so that uh, all the men who are going there, it was, it was going to be, uh, you know, a thousand plus men. So we can, whatever we can give them for storage. We and uh, I think it was wonderful. By the time it was one hour, everybody had their ideas. We put them into black and white. And uh, we said, okay, we'll meet again tomorrow here at the same time with whatever we have made. So we knew uh, uh, that it would take a day or two. And uh, after that, uh, let me tell you, I didn't see my husband. He came back only uh, to tell uh, me what had to be put into his trunks uh, for going to the, you know, you, an army, you have those steel trunks in which you put all your boots and your uniforms and all. So they were a part of our lives. And he said, you know, he just came back for half an hour to tell me this. And then after that, I didn't, didn't see him till we were going, till we were going to the station to drop them. And meanwhile, I uh, uh, went home and all of us decided that whatever we have, the envy, whatever amount of metha and whatever amount of atta, whatever we can get, we should make dry snacks. So it was like, you know, it was like Holy Diwali time when you're making and making and making snacks. So we made sweets, which could survive. We, we made salty snacks, which could survive. We made whatever possible we could give them, you know, so that they had everything, whatever was available, we could buy from the market and put it into their stocks, we told. Uh, and, you know, then you don't have the husband saying there's no pay, place and space in the trunk. So it's very nice. So, you know, you just have to tell the advocate, that, okay, we are sending all this. Now you are, the train is yours. Let me tell you, Chaitali, the train is given by Indian Railways. And the train comes and docks at the station, you know, so it will come and it will park itself in one of the uh, platforms of the station. One of the platforms which is not being used much. And we thought it's going to be three days, but then the train was uh, ready there in about a day and a half or so. So we were told that, okay, we are leaving tomorrow evening, the next day. And it was, uh, you know, we just, we got, we just cooked and cooked and cooked and put things back for our husbands, did everything and reached the station. And once we reached the station, we realized that, uh, and we ensured that, uh, you know, all ladies, everybody who wanted to go to the station, there was no question of anybody not seeing off their husband, no question of any children not seeing off their fathers. So we said, whoever wants to go, we requested. And let me tell you the uh, larger formations which were there with us. So we had a, you know, we, uh, there was a brigade, there was a div, there was a corps. So uh, it was, they were very helpful. I mean, I, I must have got hundreds of calls, everybody telling me, Mrs. Saxena, don't worry. Anything you require, 
any amount of vehicles, any amount of things. You know, you just first plan for the next two days, then we'll ask you again as to how you want to, you know, do things. So for the next two days, and when we were at the station, everybody was there at the station to see off their husbands. So, you know, you had children of all sizes from a few months till, uh, you know, teenagers. And everybody had come to see off their fathers. There were parents. Some of them had parents. Some uh, had parents were there with them. And uh, wives, of course, were all there. And uh, we came and we waited at the platform. And it took about four to five hours from when we had come, you know, for the train to actually leave. So the, you know, you, it's, it's, it's a flurry of activity and you're seeing, it gives you a, you know, it makes you proud to feel that, you know, it's a real good feeling that, you know, you are married into the army. The individual ceases to exist. That is the plus point of an army wife psychology that for her, it's the individual she's married to just ceases to exist because he's there. The fact that, you know, the pride comes that you are an army wife, you're proud to be married into that community. And we took us about, let's say, four to five hours, we waited, and then it was time for the train to move. So the uh, guard was a railway guard, and uh, the driver was also a railway driver. And they came to us and they said, you know, ma'am, up to gadi chalne ka time hai. So we said, okay, so, uh, you know, we all uh, went, our husbands were not with us, the ladies were together, they were busy, you know, doing their things. So then we went and uh, the guard also told them, he, you know, we blew his whistle and we realized it was actually time to go. So our husbands came to meet us and we just said our goodbyes and bye and we kept waving and the train went. I, I still remember that we all kept standing, waiting till we couldn't see the train. And the moment we couldn't see the train, then I said, okay, come on, girls, let's all go, let's all go, you know. So we, most of them had tears in the eyes. Children were crying. I won't say that. But then, you know, it is a very natural thing. Uh, so it's, it's something very natural. So it happened to us. But uh, we just, and, you know, we were, we knew that we won't get information because it was a time when you didn't have, uh, you know, there were no social media. There were no mobile phones. So uh, how do you get your information? So we knew that we won't get to know. So, you know, there's the army postal service was one of the best service. So you could write letters and put them into the letter box saying 56 or 99 APO, wherever the regiment is, and it would reach you. Wherever the formation is, it would reach you. That was a very comfortable address. So that is how we communicated. So we actually didn't come to know uh, for a very long time as to when did they reach and then from, from Jammu, how did they go to Kargil? We didn't know anything. It's only, you know, I mean, you're not supposed to know all that also. But then, you know, uh, yes, from uh, Jammu, you know, we had letters. Uh, which we got, you know, those, the army had its own uh, inland letters. So it was not like the letters uh, the common man had. So for the army, there were their own letters, you know, Sulu had. So we got them saying that, okay, they had reached on this date. And then, so it was, it's one of those, of course, the office, there's a small date which is left behind to look after the ladies. So, uh, you know, it was left behind for a few months and all. And uh, we uh, came to know from them. So I, I used to tell them that, uh, you know, just convey to everybody that they've reached here or they've reached here. And they're happy and safe. And after that, we would keep getting the information. That's how, you know. So it was one of the most beautiful experiences. Uh, most, uh, you know, I, I still remember out of my life of 56 plus years. I think this is one of my most, uh, you know, hair-raising experience, which, you know, where, where, where I would... See, feel not for myself, for others. I, I would just wait. I was just seeing that, okay, how's, what's happening to this lady? What's happening to that lady, you know? So you don't have time for yourself. I always feel that, uh, you know, in the regiment, the commanding officer is a father, you know? So he's called the tiger. And uh, the wife is not the tigress, I huh? remember. But then wife is like a mother figure, absolutely. So she doesn't have to, you know, she doesn't have the time to look after herself or look after her kids. So she has to see what's happening to the others. Everything is fine. So I think that was a day I realized that God had really bestowed one of its best things on me. And uh, I think uh, I was very fortunate to have seen that 99% ladies in the army do not see it. So I, it was just luck and plain and simple luck. You were at the right place at the right time. For you, it is nostalgia. And for me, as I'm hearing it now, it's like, 
a section of bollywood movie going on the way you were explaining the way you were telling i was feeling like uh, the tra- i mean somebody is shooting it it's it's like a bollywood movie like border or something which shooting in front of us and i'm sure all the listeners will have the same feeling they can visualize what exactly was happening at that time <laughs> now uh going further from what you said i'll quote in, uh, just one line when you said that you guys forget that you are an individual it ceases you become army wives you are married to the army so which means most of the army wives start giving up their careers because now they are no more individuals and they start stop thinking like individuals i guess so is it true i mean is it like they completely start giving up their careers they start giving up their lives and they are just embedded how the life is going as an army wife you know jatali everything changes with the decades when decades change with you so when our senior generation wives for them career was uh, you know uh, nobody had a career in our mother's generation very few very few i i won't say nobody but very few so that generation of army wives did not have careers they were very happy army wives and uh, you know for them it was uh, their role as army wives which was important now when we came to our generation uh, let me tell you the truth it was uh, for us also i mean we got married you know that was a time when we got married early so uh, you know you could uh, if you get married at 20 you can only be a graduate at that time and uh, 90% of us uh, had either done our graduations or post graduations and did not have careers because very few from my husband's complete course i remember only one lady who uh, had a professional career in the industry in one of the american industries otherwise i, I don't think so it was the way it was a way of life so that uh, dissatisfaction of not having a career uh, because you you never had anything planned before you got married and then what happened was in the last 20 25 years things have changed now even girls who are getting married to army officers are have their own careers because you know marriage age has changed now anybody who's getting married is getting married at even men are not getting married early so girls are getting married at let's say 25 26 27 whatever and uh, they are have their own you know careers they may they are the doctors or engineers and uh, you know career has become for a girl as important uh, as uh, for a boy in today's world now this is not just today's world so this world probably started about 20 years back when girls started wanting you know in the army it was very very comfortable for us to uh, you know have our uh, careers in the uh, you know army schools and the army public schools or the kendriya vidyalayas which were there and teaching was one of the best career we always thought because you're moving every two years every two and a half years you're moving so you cannot have a full fledged career so you can you know teach when you reach a station if there's a vacancy you can teach and then you know you can in fair and kv of course then you go to you know wait for a posting along with your husband but uh, i think that was the only career we could think of but now uh, it's very different so now when girls come and uh, you know when they come they have their careers in other fields they did start feeling that you know it was uh, you know not giving us uh, because either you you take a call whether you want to move with your husband then the career has to take a back seat if you don't want to move with your husband then husband has to take a back seat so you know that call uh, that had they had to take such calls so uh, i think that is the reason probably girls started feeling then i uh, you know i always feel uh, we have an army wives welfare association and uh, it has all levels so we had our levels of welfare and uh, uh, once uh, you know uh, the chiefs we, we we just met the chief's wife and uh, she said uh, and i was already uh, you know a journalist and uh, she asked me she said that uh, ma sangeeta have you been uh, you know all your life a journalist so i told her i said uh, i said no when i got married i was only a graduate so i was a bsc pass so he said how did you manage this career and i had a good career that time you know so uh, then i told them so she said why don't you just tell this to all the ladies it's very important for them to understand that just because they married for jesus doesn't mean there's a end of their life and career for them so they can balance the two things it's very easy to balance but yes the girls have to be told this 
Now, you know, there are going to be times when you can't move with your husband. So if you are in a field, he's in a field station, all the more easy for you to continue. If you are in a peace station, it has to be a call between the husband and wife as to how they manage. But I think the men also, you know, have got used to the fact that they've got working wives because when they got married, they knew that they were marrying a professional wife. They were marrying a professional girl. They were going to have a professional wife. So I think today it's better, it's easier for them to take, you know, those decisions together. And I don't think uh, they should have a problem. We want our girls to enter. We are planning for them to enter NDA. We are planning for them to enter. They were already there in the medical corps. And would we want our girls to not have their careers once they had studied? No. We would have wanted them to continue with their careers. So there's nothing wrong in wanting to have a career along with your married life. So the only thing is that, you know, in the army, the adjustment has to be a little because then you are not in one city. So like you are in one city, you are in Cyprus, you stay there. I'm in Delhi, I'm staying here. If I have to live the next 20 years in uh, Delhi, I have no problem. I can continue on with my job. My husband can continue with his job. But that's the only way we are different from the normal, uh, uh, you know, couples. So we have a nomadic lifestyle and we have to, you know, make the best out of that lifestyle. And I think that's the only way you can do that. You can plan it together. So once, uh, I mean, I always feel that one station, you know, uh, if you want to have for, let's say, you know, it always can be planned that one station can be a peace station. Then if one is a field station automatically, you know, then gives you uh, at stretch, let's say five to six years in one place. So I think such things have to be sorted out, you know, they have to be sorted out. But uh, I don't think there's any reason, any career, which will give you as much satisfaction as being an army wife. So I think if, the, if you have the, had the privilege of being an army wife, then I think you can always juggle them. So, I mean, I, but that's my thought. It could be uh, I mean, wrong, but then that's my thought. Oh, absolutely. I agree. It's, uh, it's true what you said, that um, you can, you can, uh, it's up to your wish. You can juggle the roles and uh, you can be satisfied with that. Last 30 minutes as I spoke to you, you have been a very satisfied army wife. If I'm right, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. So, is there is there a um, something like a key? Yes, these are the keys that you will be a very satisfied army army wife, as well as you can have your own uh, individual. You will you are individual and you will stick to that as well. So, what is that? What is that transformation? What is that key that you have followed? You know, Chetali, the drive has to be within you. You can, you can be a very nice wife, you can be a great daughter, great daughter-in-law, great mother, and you know you can make the best of your army life and enjoy. Uh, you know, army also makes you enjoy a lot. So you've got a lot of social life, you've got, you know, it's good fun. Uh, you have been, uh, you know, you can have your picnics, you can have this, you get, you get used to enjoying when you are uh, together. But the fact remains that the drive has to be within you. You cannot crib. If I didn't have the drive within me as a BSc pass, how would I have come to this situation where you're sitting in front of me and interviewing me? So my drive was only one that I wanted to study. I was good in academics. I wanted to study. So I said, okay, what do I study? I could not have taken my subject, which was science, because I had two children, uh, which I had in quick succession, you know. So uh, by the time I was 25, I had both my children and I was married for five years. So I said, okay, what do I do with both these children? Can I pick up a career which will give me a career, give me satisfaction, but also not let me be in the lab for eight, eight hours and not let me, and then, you know, give me a career immediately after studies. Now, suppose I wanted to teach, I would have to do my master's then do my BA and then do things. So I, the drive was there. I had a hobby of writing. When I was also studying in Delhi University, there used to be an essay writing competition, which I always won. So I always felt, you know, that I could uh, convert my hobby into my profession. And uh, very fortunately, I was sitting on the scooter with one child standing in the front, one in my lap. And we had gone, yeah, we were in Pune and I had gone for uh, this lunch at one of those restaurants. We'd gone for one lunch on a Sunday. And I was sitting, look, looking the other way. And suddenly saw the Department of Journalism in front of me. And I told my husband, stop, stop, stop. I said, let's find out if they have some course which I can do after my graduation. 
So we just walked in into the dean's room. I can never forget that uh, my, the dean was sitting there and my husband int introduced himself and he said, my wife wants to do uh, a master's in your uh, journalism. Do you have one? So he says, yeah, we have a postgraduate degree. We don't have a master's. We, had a, we have a postgraduate bachelor's degree. So he said, but you, she has to take an entrance test. And uh, my husband said, okay, fine. You know, there's no other way. He says, no, there's no other way. So uh, my husband said, you know, you've left your studies for so long. I said, don't worry. I'll prepare for it. I prepared. I cleared. I cleared. I did the course. Regular basis. I didn't even miss one day in class because the feeling that you are leaving your kids and going to study is so strong that you don't want to do anything else except go to the department and study and come. So, of course, the fun of being with a group and going out for tea and coffee and khana and pina and good fun was not there. I used to rush, study, take, attend the classes and come back home. But then I managed to do it. If I can manage to do it, I think the drive has to be within you. If you want to do anything in life, you have to take your breaks. After that, my husband went on a field posting and I went to my in-laws and stayed there. So, I mean, that they, it was a very small town. The question of uh, reading the day, same day's newspaper also was not there those days because we got the paper of a day uh, prior. So uh, yeah, journalism was beyond question. But I stayed there for two years and then, you know, it was nice. Went, came to a good station, came to a good station and realized that here was something which I could do something. So then I realized, oh, there are three newspapers in the city, English newspapers. I went, told them that I like, want to write. They said, write. Starting from a beat like, you're a journalist, you will understand. Starting from a beat like, uh, uh, you know, doing a profile of a man who was in the industry, one of the vice presidents of one of the local industries, who had written a book on, uh, you know, uh, this thing, uh, investigative stories. And uh, I was asked to write a book review. I wrote that. I was good in the language I was professing in. So uh, I was given a better story, a better beat. The better beat was municipality. And then after beyond that, I came. And then eventually, you know, because I was staying, staying in the cantonment and uh, there was this uh, golden jubilee happening of that cantonment. And um, it was, I was told to cover it. I covered it. They liked it. They gave me the defense. So that's how I made a career. I had my breaks when my children were studying. That's how we met Chatali. When my children were studying, I took a break to teach. Because it gave you holidays along with the children. It gave you, uh, you know, uh, time to be with them. They were growing up. Your career takes a back seat because their career has to take priority. So uh, I took that break. The moment both of them went away, I uh, realized that I could go back to my first love, which was journalism. I went back to it. And I went as a professional uh, to cover. Yes, you do realize that the people who were with you have gone much ahead. But you have the satisfaction of having done all the things together and done it well. So that does, then you start afresh and you start new and which is nothing wrong. I felt there was nothing wrong in it and uh, I could do it. So my, uh, you know, I would always like to tell girls, the future generations of army wives that, uh, you know, you, you can absolutely balance out both the things with a feeling of satisfaction that you've done eventually, you've done the right thing for both the sides. So you did the right thing for your career. You also did the right thing for your family. So I think nothing more than that, you know, I think the drive has to be within you. If you have the drive, you can do everything. If you don't have the drive, you can't blame the army and its uh, ways of nomadic life for it. No, that you can't. You have to have the drive. You can't say, oh, I couldn't do it because, you know, I was an army wife. No, I couldn't do it. No, you didn't have the drive. If you had the drive, you could have done it. Rather than putting a blame game, Put it on yourself. Yeah, yes, absolutely. <laughs> As I said, 18 years, I know a lot about you. Personally, professionally, everything. Much more than everything, I thought. But today was different. I got to know our army's wife, an ex-army's wife. Her perspective, how she was so happy in her life, how she was just being an army wife. She was so proud of herself, of her husband, everything. Thank you so much, ma'am. I'm sure... Uh, this will be, this will be like for all the other ladies, not only for the defense people we have been, uh, our audience have been the defense uh, people and the journalists, but also for those army wives who will be hearing you will be able to identify themselves with you. And Chitali, my last sentence, which I just wanted to tell you was, I took a great pride in being an army wife. 
I take greater pride in being a veteran's wife. It gives me ample opportunity to talk, you know, which and to tell the future generations that this is what you can do and this is how you can really live a wonderful life. You know, because then you are, uh, you know, beyond any of these army acts. So, you know, they do not for wives, but then you still don't want to talk about a lot of things when you are a serving officer's wife. So it's great pride to be a veteran's wife as much as I took pride in being a serving officer's wife. As I said, yes, they will be able to identify a lot with you. And I am so glad and I'm very happy that we decided to do this. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thanks for your time. And definitely, as we are working more, we will get to know more from you. Thank you.